Shattering Myths. I am Yana. Each weekday here on GCN, we strive to expose the deadly and the destructive myths that are associated with religion, politics, patriotism, the media, military, and economic schemes. Instead of merely presenting the news, our mission is to understand what is actually occurring behind those headlines while predicting how these events will shape our world over the next 10 to 20 years. Then during our second hour, we're going to engage God on his terms through evidence and reason, since his is the lone reliable voice in an exceedingly troubled world. Our phone number over the next two hours, if you'd like to participate in this discussion, is toll-free, 877-376-45. During the uh, Salem uh, news this morning, which is a Christian uh, news source, we uh, had a, uh, an endorsement for the notion that if you join Christian Mingle, you'll find God's uh, uh, partner for your life. What do you think about that, Scott? That sounds kind of... Dum, 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 dum. Yeah, welcome to the nature of religion. As we move through the news this morning, we're also going to find uh, a little bit about um, Muslim mingle. Uh, it has a better roll off the tongue, the alliteration I sort of like. And so after we consider uh, the, the events uh, in uh, Israel, we will turn to Muslim mingle. Dateline Jerusalem, this is from CNN. Could Israel be considering a monumentous concession that, that would change the course of 40 years of history with the Palestinians? Well, to begin, as we talked yesterday, there is no such thing as a Palestinian, and the uh, uh, Yehudim and Yisraelites have a history with Yisrael that goes back uh, fully 4,000 years. There is no history with uh, the people who are mythically known as the Palestinians in that place. A news report, a show of goodwill and diplomatic murmurs by the United States and its Arab partners are stroking hopes that the glacial budge in Israel's position could lead Israelis and the mythical people known as the Palestinians, I'm adding that to correct the document that I'm reading, to talk seriously about peace again. You know, there has never been peace in the history of Islam. It is true that, uh, that the Palestinians are Arabs, and that's really all they are. They're just Muslim Arabs. There is no such thing as a Palestinian. There was not even a mention of Palestine prior to the upheaval that uh, the Muslim Arabs began following uh, the Holocaust when Yehudim were offered 0.02% of the Middle East. That's when the, this myth of a Palestinian people in a place of called Palestine began uh, to grow. But, you know, if you look at the history of Islam, when Muhammad created Islam, the pagan Arabs of the time had no history of ever uh, leaving their borders to wage war on anyone. They were not known to plunder or pillage. They uh, had no militias. There isn't a single record in Saudi Arabia, Arabia as it used to be, nor among any of the literate nations around Arabia, which would include the Persians, which would include uh, the Greeks, which would include the Egyptians, which would include the Babylonians and the Assyrians, even the Byzantines. There isn't a single record of Muslims prior to Muhammad becoming warlike terrorists and barbarians attacking their neighbors. Muhammad creates Islam, and in the first 10 years of the Islamic era, he leads 75 terrorist raids. They're murderous. The women are raped, the men are killed, the children are enslaved. The victims have their lands confiscated and all of their possessions robbed. 75 terrorist raids in the first 10 years of the Islamic era. Following Muhammad's death, Muslims fight the war of compulsion, forcing all who live in Arabia to either surrender and submit to Islam or die. Once Arabia is unified under Islam, once its poison is fully ingested, Muslims flee out of Arabia, killing over 200 million people 
from India to the far, far west coasts of Africa up into southern Europe. 200 million people dead as a result of this vicious religion. It has never known peace. There is no peace in Islam. All of the calls for killing in Islam are open-ended. They're not for a specific place or for a specific time. They are for the whole world. They are for all time. So long as Islam exists, there will be no peace. If you think that there will be peace in Israel when the West capitulates, particularly the United States capitulates to the Muslims there, then just look at Syria, look at Libya, look at Egypt, look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan, look at Pakistan. Look at any of these nations, including the Sudan and Somalia. If you think it's such a good idea to create a state for terrorists, look at the examples all around. You know, it's amazing that the United States would muddle here again. Everything we have touched in the Middle East has turned to goo. We have consistently made very bad situations much worse. We are the reason that there's a civil war where 100,000 people have died in Syria. Had we not invaded Iraq and given Iraq to Iran, that would not be the case. We are the reason that Iran is on the cusp of completing its nuclear bomb. We are the reason that terrorism has returned to Iraq. We are the reason behind the upheavals in Egypt. Haven't we mucked up the Middle East enough to recognize we ought to opt out? The only place throughout the entire Middle East that has any degree of sanity, any degree of, of civil nature, any degree of, of justice and opportunity is Israel. And what is the United States doing trying to screw that up to? I mean, if you are a patriot, if you support this government... You're an imbecile. Get the hell out. Leave them alone. You know, you've already bankrupted this country. You've turned this country into the laughing stock of the world. And now you want to go and mess up Israel? What is it that the United States has become so bad that the only way that the United States can look good by comparison to other countries is to destroy any country that there's any hope and opportunity or economic prosperity or freedom? Is that our goal? Or has this administration become so Islamic in its leanings that all it cares about is giving Muslims what they want, what they crave, fully recognizing that the consequence of doing so will be what we witnessed in Egypt what we are witnessing now in Turkey, what we're witnessing in Syria, in Yemen, Somalia, and the Sudan. The Reuters news agency quoted an Israeli official last week who said Israel agreed to a peace plan uh, based upon the 1967 borders with land swaps. The moment Israel capitulates to that, we're within 15 years of world war. It will be identical to what happened with Neville Chamberlain when he went to Czechoslovakia, a place that he had no influence over, should have had no influence over, and gave the Nazis much of Czechoslovakia, all of the high ground of Czechoslovakia. And rather than satiating the bloodlust of the Nazis, which is a religion very similar to Islam, all he did is enrage them and embolden them, and within a year there was a world war where 55 million people died. The only possible outcome of surrendering the West Bank to the Muslims, especially after having narrowed Israel at the waist by having Israel surrender Gaza to the Muslims, is World War III. The moment we force this upon Israel, two things will happen. 
One is we will have lit the fuse for World War III, an Islamic war against Israel that will spew out of that and engulf the entire world in war. And the utter destruction of the United States. Because we will have been responsible, and there are consequences for that. So be aware. For those who are patriotic, for those who are political, for those who support this government, or even the one prior, because George Bush wanted to do the same thing. That the moment we force Israel to give up the, world, the West Bank, the moment we do that, and to make concessions on Jerusalem. We have lit the fuse of World War III. It will be impossible to snuff out. Billions of people will die, and the United States' the largest cities will be destroyed. That is the consequence. It is inevitable. It is uh, something the United Nations demanded in uh, Resolution 19, uh, in 1967. Yes, you see, the uh, United Nations uh, doesn't like uh, Israel. And uh, the United Nations loves uh, Islam. And so when all of Israel's neighbors, having failed to destroy Israel in the uh, War of Independence massed their troops on Israel's borders, blockaded Israel so that it could receive no assistance from anyone, and began to, to shout that they would drive Israel into the sea, both in Egypt and in Syria, telling them this was the ultimate and last war, and that Israel would soon be destroyed the day before that war would have begun, Israel conducted a preemptive strike. In six days, the arrogant Muslims were destroyed. Israel was could have moved into Cairo and captured all of Egypt. They had captured the Sinai. They could have been in Damascus on the seventh day. They controlled everything. They had won. All of that land could have been theirs and should have been theirs. We'll return to Shattering Myths in a moment. Welcome back to Shattering Myths. I, as I read these words about the potential for uh, Israel to capitulate based upon the uh, ultimatums by the United States, come to recognize that... Uh, that the United States uh, is really dastardly behind the scenes. That's one of the things we learned from the uh, WikiLeaks uh, documents, is that the United States is incredibly and grotesquely immoral behind the scenes, the way that it uh, plays. And for the United States to push Israel to the point that's even considering this, the kinds of threats the United States is making quietly uh, have to be uh, uh, repulsive. You know, we are already supplying uh, the Muslim uh, nations surrounding Israel who have but one enemy, which is Israel, with 24 times more weapons than we supply Israel. 24 to 1. We've been doing that for decades now. We are uh, in a position where uh, we enrich all of uh, Israel's neighbors because of OPEC and our positions relative to not de developing our own uh, energy reserves here in America. And all of our, our diplomatic efforts are opposed to Israel and in favor of her foes. Now, that's stupid because Israel's foes also happen to be America's foes. That's stupid because Israel's foes are amongst the most despicable places on earth to live. They treat women as if they were dirt. They're savages, brutal, vicious murderers. Kidnappers, robbers, terrorists. And yet we have sided with them routinely against Israel. Unbelievably stupid. 
Well, this uh, article goes on to say it's something uh, the United Nations has demanded in the resolutions uh, of 1967. Now, imagine that. I mean, almost every nation on Earth is uh, now defined in terms of its territory by the land that it conquered. The United States is, is that way. Much of the territory of the United States is either land that uh, we stole from uh, other countries or other people, or that we bought from those who had previously taken advantage of others. Now, if, if Israel is to, if the same standard for Israel should exist for the United States, then the United States is, uh, doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. America's history relative to its growth as in territory is despicable. Israel's is not. I mean, if you want to apply that standard to Israel, then America has to vanish. We have, we have a history that is utterly despicable. Israel doesn't. It is absurd to tell Israel that after they prevail in three wars where Islam in a unified fashion chose to wipe them off the map and they prevailed in all three wars and they retained a very small buffer of what historically has always been their land. And we want them to get it back so that they become indefensible. We want to reward the tactics of terrorism that have been deployed to bring the world to this position. It's a sign that either the United States is grotesquely immoral, ignorant to the point of being stupid, or wholly irrational, incapable of exercising good judgment. Take your pick. But if you're amongst those who support your country and its endeavors worldwide, who think of America as a moral force for good in the world, then I'm going to tell you, you're borderline insane. This uh, requires Israel to withdraw from occupied territories. Why is it? Why, why don't they ask America to uh, withdraw from occupied territories? Why don't we give the entire western three-quarters of America back to the Indians? Why don't we give southern America back to the Mexicans? Why don't we? You know, if that's what, if they're occupied territories because they were gained through war, then why are they to give them back and we are not? I mean, the America's wars were offensive. Israel's wars were defensive. I mean, they're on the high moral ground. We're not. We have no right. Anyone in the world, from the United Nations to America, has no right to impose this on Israel. Mind you, God gave this land to them. I'm Yada. This is Shattering Mist. Back in a moment. Welcome back to Shattering Miss. I am your host, uh, Yada. We have uh, Nick on the uh, the line. Uh, hello, Nick. How are you this morning? Good. Good morning. I'm good. Good. Um, so I want I want to ask you if you know who it is or anything about a person named Abu Hurairah. Yeah, Hura Yah uh, is the uh, yeah. Hura uh, Yah, uh, the um, um, individual is uh, is uh, fairly well known in the uh, the archives of uh, of Islam. He is the uh, uh, the fellow that is uh, um, the source 
of a disproportionate number of hadith. He's the uh, the first isnad listed on uh, on uh, many hadith. Uh, isnad is the uh, the chain of reporters that are assigned to a hadith. So a a hadith to be considered official has to have the first isnad or chain of uh, of oral reporters has to be someone who was a companion of Muhammad. And then uh, the in the next on down the line also cuz you know the like the Quran the hadith was passed on from uh, uh mouth to ear mouth to ear mouth to ear generations after generation. Uh so uh in the hadith a special attention is uh, is um is applied to who the first, second, and third uh, Isnad uh, reports um, uh, conveyed this. And does the, he uh, does he does he uh, keeps the chain of uh, does his uh, habit uh, keeps the chain of who says what to who? Yeah, it, the uh, the Isnad tells us uh, who it is that uh, has passed on this uh, statement. I mean, almost all of the hadith are. Um, are statements either made by Muhammad uh, or uh, uh, statements by Muhammad's companions to Muhammad upon which Muhammad responds. So almost all of them are made uh, about uh, either from Muhammad or interactions uh, with Muhammad. And uh, this fellow is the uh, is the most prolific of the uh, uh, Isnad um, and uh, or therefore oral reporters of the sayings from Muhammad. Um, I'll give you an example. Here's one of his, uh, of his hadith. He, uh, he said, I um, uh, uh, was talking about, um, let's see if I can find one here that would be uh, interesting. Uh, oh, yeah, here's one. While uh, on the road to uh, Mecca for the pilgrimage, the wind blew so hard that Umar asked, can anyone nar narrate to us something the Prophet said about wind? None of those present could answer. When the news uh, of this reached Abu uh, Hurya, uh, he uh, rode up uh, to Umar and said, Commander of the believers, I was uh, told uh, that you asked about wind, and I myself heard the Prophet say, the wind is a spirit from Allah. It brings mercy and it brings torment. Therefore, when you experience it, do not curse it, but ask Allah for its goodness and seek refuge in him from its harm. That's the kind of stuff that uh, came from um, from him. Pretty, uh, <laughs> does, <laughs> yeah. Does, it's, a, uh, does a book, is a book, uh, prof, uh, Prophet of Doom contain the uh, this guy in it like um, yes he, yes yes he is the his uh, uh, he is listed as an isnad or the first of the oral reporters um, I, on I think it's 5,700 of these uh, hadith um, and so uh, many of those that are chronicled in Ishak's uh, Sirah or biography of Muhammad, many of those chronicled in Tabati's history of uh, Islam's formation and the Tariq, uh, and many of those that are reported by both uh, Muslim and Bukhari uh, have uh, him listed as the first in the, uh, the line of reporters. Uh, his uh, isnads are all over the board. I mean, they're, they're like everything else that we have from uh, Muhammad. There's many that are warlike and jihadist. There's many that are just unbelievably stupid, like the one I just read to you. Uh, they're just like all the rest of, um, of, uh, of the Hadith. They depict Muhammad as a, as a perverted moron. Well, th thank you uh, very much. Um, you, I, I, I like that search bar in your uh, on the Prophet of Doom website where I can just put that fellow's name and. Yeah, the, with, uh, yeah. The difficulty, and yeah, let me tell you what I what I did in Prophet of Doom that wouldn't help you a lot in this particular question is that um, I referenced the all the hadith that I cited. I referenced the 
uh, nomenclature that is used in each of the four books, like on on uh, the Sira, uh, I simply uh, referenced uh, the the English translation of the Sira by uh, Goulomé, uh, the the page and the edition that uh, that uh, that quotation is found on, and. Uh, and Tabati, uh, the English translation is done by the uh, by SUNY, uh, the State uh, University of New York, and it's in various volumes. And I would cite the volume and the page that the quotation is found on, in the only English translation of the of Tabati's collection of hadith. And Muslim and Bukhari, I cited the uh, the nomenclature that's that is the most commonly used, although in those. There are many differences between how they are uh, numbered in terms of uh, a volume uh, and, and specific hadith. What I did not do, well, I, I described the nature of an isnad, and sometimes I listed uh, who was the first to report it. For the most part, uh, if I had put down the list of, of uh, 10 to 15 names, every time that uh, I shared one of the many thousands of hadith in Prophet of Doom, it would have made the book, uh, instead of uh, 1,000 pages, it would have been 2,000 pages. But um, if you go to either any of the source materials that I, I cited, in those source materials, under that specific reference, you'll find the chain of reporters are, uh, are ISNAD. And this fellow uh, is, um, is the most prevalent of them. Mm -hmm. Possible. Uh, I mean, thank you for uh, sure. Info. Sure. Uh, sure. One of the things that is uh, is important in this regard is to recognize that the same individuals who uh, um, passed on the Quran to us are the same individuals who passed on the Hadith. The Quran and the Hadith come from the same individual, from uh, Muhammad. Uh, and so their credibility is identical. If Muhammad's Quran citations are untrue, then his Hadith citations are untrue, and vice versa. If his Hadith citations are untrue, his Quran statements are untrue. And if the Hadith have been uh, corrupted over time, if they're not trustworthy in terms of what Muhammad actually did and said, then the Quran isn't either, because again, came from the same person, passed on through the generations in exactly the same way. And so there really is no difference, and I know Muslims will have a conniption fit over this, but if you want to approach this from an informed and rational point of view, there is no difference between the Quran and the Hadith. They come from the same person. They were presented to us and memorialized, handed down to us in exactly the same way by the same individuals in the same manner at the same time. And so it is, uh, it is also important to recognize that as it relates to Sharia law, as it relates also just to the general practice of the religion of Islam, the hadith are vastly more important than is the Quran. Muslims will tell you the Quran is their, you know, their holy book. Well, the Quran is, is a jumbled mess. It uh, has no context, no chronology, and and the practice of Islam and the law of Islam, Sharia, are based entirely on Muhammad's words and examples. It's called Sunnah. The only place you find Muhammad's words and example is in the Hadith. And so these Hadith are uh, totally and completely responsible uh, for um, um, Islam, its practice, and its, uh, its name. Uh, and you know, if you read particularly the history of, of this uh, individual, what you uh, find is that he is the most responsible also for passing on the initial surahs of the Quran. He even rivals Muhammad himself and says, you know, with uh, Muhammad, uh, it was, there were cases where he forgot a surah or misquoted it, but uh, this fellow always uh, had it right. Uh, Hurriyah is the, uh, is the man's name. So that's the, uh, the history of it. And the reason that's important and germane to our current discussion is because what America is doing is trying to turn over the the only sane and civil part of the Middle East, the only part that's not completely destroyed and corrupted and perverted by Islam, to the Muslims. Why on earth would anyone do that? 
Uh, there's another story here. This is we're going to call uh, uh, Muslim Mingle uh, in Dubai from CNN. Norwegian interior designer Marte Debra uh, Dalev uh, had uh, spoken out after uh, being handed a 16-month prison sentence in Dubai. What was her crime? Now, she was given a 16-month prison sentence in Dubai. What was this Norwegian interior designer's crime? She was raped. She went to police and reported the rape by a Muslim colleague. The 24-year-old was convicted in sentences on charges of having unlawful sex. You see, if you're raped by a Muslim in an Islamic country, rather than the Muslim being charged with a crime, the victim is charged with a crime. That's how. Uh, that's, but understand, it is Islam that we're trying to give Israel to. And it is in Islam where the victim of rape is sentenced to jail. She had unlawful sex because she was raped. And then she was also uh, jailed for making a false statement and illegal consumption of alcohol, which was, by the way, served in a bar in Dubai. Her story is dominating the headlines in Norway, and it has raised serious questions over the way women who allege sexual assault are uh, treated in the United Arab Emirates. Why couldn't the folks from CNN tell us the truth? It's not the case of just the United Arab Emirates. In every Islamic country, when a woman is raped, she's the one who goes to jail. We see this every day in Afghanistan. We saw it routinely in Iraq. When Americans are in a position to witness what's happening in the Islamic world, it is ubiquitous. It's part of Islam. Because, you see, in Islam, rape is sanctioned. Even in the Quran, rape is sanctioned. In the Hadith, Muhammad was a multiple rapist. Every time that his goons savaged a civilian community, Muhammad picked first of the woman that he would rape. And so, in Islam, rape is A-OK, -okay, but the victim of rape, oh, she goes to jail. We'll be back to Shattering Miss in a moment. Back to Shattering Miss. I'm your host, Yada. We're talking about uh, the prevalence of, uh, of sexual abuse in uh, Islam. Now, mind you, this I'm sharing this with you in concert with uh, the realization the United States is trying to force Israel to uh, cede vast swaths of, uh, of its territory to the Muslims. And so the lone place in the uh, Islamic Middle East that uh, isn't ravaged by this kind of, uh, of repulsive uh, religion and uh, and therefore laws is the one place that we're trying to give to the very people who think that it is appropriate to jail the victim of rape uh, as opposed to prosecute the rapist. Well, Marte uh, Delev, who had been working as an interior designer in a uh, design firm in Qatar since September uh, 2011, told CNN on Saturday how a trip to Dubai in March with three colleagues turned into a nightmare. She said she was out drinking uh, with her uh, colleagues, and uh, when she wanted to return to her to hotel room at 3 a.m., which probably was not uh, the best judgment on uh, on her part, she'd asked uh, one of the uh, of the men who was familiar with the uh, the hotel and the community to walk her back because she says the hotel was very large and uh, confusing and she uh, she just wanted uh, you know uh, uh, protection on the way back well when they got back to the hotel uh, she was taken to a room that was not hers she was then uh, knocked out she uh, awoke with the man uh, raping her uh, and uh, she uh, said that uh, when uh, she was uh, there naked on the bed uh, on her belly and, uh, and this man was, was savagely raping her, sodomizing her, uh, that uh, she, uh, uh, when the man finally left, she got dressed, made it downstairs, and uh, called the police, made a report to the police of what had happened, was interrogated by the police. In fact, the police, all males at the time, said, so you're, uh, you only called us because uh, you uh, decided that you didn't like the sex. Uh, 
Well, as it turns out, uh, after she was abused by the uh, the police, she was given a piece of paper that uh, that said, uh, "You're we're going to keep your passport," uh, and the piece of paper says you're going to be charged with the uh, the crime of unlawful sex. She uh, then uh, uh, got. Uh, uh, hold of her employer, told their employer what had happened, and her employer gave her the advice. They said, hey, listen, if you just go in and say it was consensual sex and that it was not um, uh, rape, then all of this will blow over. They'll give you your passport back, and you can be out of there. So she went back to the police and said, okay, I, I'm told to tell you that it was consensual sex. So give me my passport back, and I'm going to leave. And they said, okay, well, now we're going to add the charge of filing a false report uh, to, uh, to your list of charges. They uh, convicted her, and uh, she was serving a 16-month prison sentence, her crime having been raped. So the, uh, uh, it became so much of an issue in Europe that, the, uh, that uh, yesterday... The, uh, the government said, all right, uh, of Dubai said, you know, we're, we built all these fancy hotels to try to attract uh, European money uh, here. So now the, uh, maybe the best thing is, is let's free her because this is really bad for business. We're not going to get any Europeans, particularly women, willing to come here if we imprison for 16-month jail terms the victims of rape. So she was uh, let free yesterday. But can you imagine a religion so disgusting? And what we find is in Afghanistan, where the United States uh, stupidly invaded that country and on false pretenses, that, uh, and that after our invasion of Afghanistan, as bad as the conditions were for uh, Muslim women prior to our invasion, they're vastly worse now. And there are countless little girls in jail in Afghanistan, and their crime is either... They were raped, and they're in jail because they were raped, or they're in jail because uh, their family sold them to some dirty old man, and uh, they uh, decided that, you know, they don't want to be the sex slave, and they don't want to be physically abused by some Muslim man. And when they refused, they're thrown in jail. Now, that leads us to, uh, to a story that uh, was reported by the BBC uh, Earlier this week, the headline begins, more than 30 million girls risk being subjected to female genital mutilation over the next decade. That's how many little girls had their genitals mutilated by their mothers over the last decade. What we'll find, and we're going to return to this story in our program tomorrow, is there's a direct correlation between the prevalence of Islam and the prevalence of female genital mutilation. It is something we need to know because the United States is trying to force Israel to give up its land to people who practice such savagery. We'll be back with Shattering Miss in a moment.